Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special uh, webcast on a very relevant topic, which is adapting to the new normal, uh, the future of work and skills. This is brought to you by NTC Learning Hub and Tech Talent Assembly, along with KPI Soft and SHRN. Thank you for joining us today. So for this topic, we have three very, very eminent speakers. We have Mr. Kwek Kok Kwong, or KK, who is the Chief Executive Officer of NTUC Learning Hub. He has been the CEO of NTUC Learning Hub since February 2013. And prior to that, he's ha uh, he has served with distinction in the Singapore Armed Forces for 27 years and uh, has been taking NTUC Learning Hub to new heights ever since he's taken over the mantle there. So welcome, uh, KK, looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I would now like to introduce uh, Mr. NG Kyong Gi, uh, who is the chairman, Yellow Pages Private Limited and founding president of Tech Talent Assembly. Uh, he is the current chairman of uh, Yellow Pages Private Limited and is the, has been uh, leading the digital transformation uh, over there. He's a prominent history uh, industry leader, sorry, and has 30 years of experience in the IT sector. So welcome to this conversation, Piyamgi. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to your uh, contribution. And uh, last but not least, let me introduce Mr. Prithvi Shergil, who is the Chief Business Officer at KPI Technologies. Uh, he's also had a very distinguished career in the HR space. He was CHRO at HCL uh, Technologies, a prominent leader in the technology space. Uh, he uh, Prior to that, he has over 30 years of experience in HR, having worked with organizations such as HCL, uh, Accenture, etc. And very, very passionate, I know personally, about uh, this particular topic. So welcome, Prithvi. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm Archana Jarrath, and I'm Director of Operations at uh, Sherm, APAC, and Nina, and I'll be moderating this conversation with our three distinguished speakers today. Uh, before we begin, uh, we all understand how important and relevant this topic is. It has become a very, very uh, key focus area for organizations, for us as employees, as well as for HR leaders, particularly and learning development leaders on, uh, you know, what is the future of work and what are the skills required? If you look at it from three particular lens for HR, one is that with the advent of covid uh, you know, the whole remote work has become more, uh, obviously has become very, very, uh, you know, widespread. And it is considered that even, you know, from a recent report of Gartner as as uh, recently as May, uh, it talks about that 48% organizations will actually be looking at globally remote work becoming a permanent or a semi-permanent, uh, you know, uh, uh, structure of the org code organization, which also means that how do leaders manage remote workers, how do organizations in a very, very cost uh, constrained environment ensure that they are uh, hiring for the right skills, ensuring that they are skilling their own employees for the right skills and deploying uh, their employees to the right goals. Uh, so skilling becomes a top priority of leaders today. Uh, it always has been and much more relevant today. Uh, moving to a more, uh, sorry, my apologies, uh, moving to a more, uh, you know, specific study that has been done by NTUC Learning Hub uh, in Singapore itself, which talks about locally, what are the kind of trends we're looking at. So if you look at it, 84% of organizations are leveraging this time and have been for the last few months in sending their workers for trainings and ensuring that they are managing the right skills uh, and uh, mapping the right skills for their organizations. And what are the kind of key skills that, that have really gained importance in this period? Uh, the soft skills or adaptive skills really are 65% organizations are talking about that being the most relevant. And of course, competencies have always been important and they continue to be important. However, soft skills today or adaptive skills become that much more important. And related to that, there is a study done by uh, Tech Talent Assembly, which also talks about, you know, in the very vain, what are organizations looking at? Of course, this looks at specifically ITC industry, but it can be, you know, relevant for most uh, industries today. So over academic uh, qualifications, organizations are looking at relevant work experience and very importantly, having the relevant skills uh, industry expertise, and then you have the academic qualifications, and that's what organizations are looking at today uh, when it comes to hiring uh, employees within the organization. So without wasting much time, let me move into the conversation itself. And uh, 
welcome Prithvi, KK, and Kyongi to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So my first question, uh, KK, is to you. Uh, you know, we talked. I, I shared a little bit about the study, and which talks about you know eighty five percent or sixty five percent organization are really focused on adaptive skills today. Uh, why do you think this is so important in the post COVID era? Uh, thank you, Achana. Uh, thanks, thanks for inviting me into this uh, stamina. Uh, first of all, maybe just let me uh, share with uh, everybody here how I think about the future skills of workers. Sure. About two years back, actually, what we decided to do was to think about what the composition of a worker 4.0. And we decided that uh, there are three critical components. One is the adaptive skills. And I decided to use the word adaptive skills mainly because I think if you look at the world today, um, a lot of things are changing very rapidly. So the ability to adapt is really important. Um, and the ability to innovate is very important. I, I just feel that the word soft skill doesn't give that uh, that drive and impetus to describe the attributes needed for future workers. So the first thing is adaptive skill. And the second thing that we think about is that even if you have the adaptive skills, I think because the world is so driven by technology, we feel that actually the technology part has to come into play understanding technology. So um, many of us in a few years back, if you think about it, we struggle with terminologies like IoT, you know, uh, big data and stuff like that. And I feel that it's important for workers to acquire those vocabulary. So that's the second one. And the third skills that we think about is technical skills, which I think traditionally we call it the hard skills. So for us to transit from the industry 3.0 to 4.0, really we need workers who are strong and adapting to the new environment because the world is changing so fast and we need to embrace technology because that's the only way we can drive better results and connectivity. But technical skills or hard skills is still very important. It will be quite misleading for us, for me to say that technical skill is not something that people look for. And in fact, there's a saying that goes like this, that actually technical skills gets you the job. So when we look at interview, for example, we always say, what kind of technical skills? If I'm looking at marketing manager, I look at your credentials uh, in terms of marketing, right? Before I think about soft skills. So it gets you the job. But when you are in the job to get progression, to get promotion, right? Actually, that's where adaptive skills and technology comes into play. So to get you to keep the job, to get you progress in the job, really, you need that. So these three bubbles are really quite important. Um, as to your question, why is it important? Because I think the world is just changing so quickly, faster than before. Um, and in COVID, we witnessed that already. In fact, there's some literature that says that the pace of change is brought forward by five years, which means that actually what we did in the last three months, if you leave it to the natural forces uh, without COVID, you will probably take five years. But because of that burning platform, we just have to do it a lot faster. And that's where I think your ability to adapt is important. Last but not least, maybe just I just referenced to the, uh, the survey that we did. Um, in, in the top 10 skills, uh, this is uh, the survey done by NTC Learning Hub. The top 10 skills, adaptive skills that is required, top in the list actually is adaptability and resilience. Because all of us feel stressed out. I, I felt stressed out over the last five months over adapting to change. I feel stressed out uh, trying to figure out what's happening and how to figure out our business. And, and really adaptive skills and resilience. And you must have the tenacity, right? So that you don't give up. So I think that's really quite important. And the second thing is that really the second uh, demanded skill is really about teamwork and collaboration. Uh, in this current world, we really don't have to do everything ourselves. In fact, we should leverage on partnership. And, and I think you see right in front of us at the panels, we are all working together. <laughs> I'm working with Tiongi, I'm working with Ravi, and because I don't believe in doing it myself, because it's just not possible. All right. So we we our ability to to get that teamwork going, to collaborate across boundaries, really important. And that shows in our survey. And the third thing is about innovation, really how you monetize your ideas, right? Not just having ideas, but turning ideas into businesses, 
viable solutions for the people. So these are the top three skills. And I, I think the reasons are quite obvious because the world just changed too fast. Yeah. So that, that's my quick response to you. Thank you. Well, no, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, technical skills or the competency. Uh, but I think uh, the, along with that, more and more emphasis is being put on the adaptability and resilience and the innovation that you were talking about. So very rightly said, and thank you for those insights. Uh, Tiongi, coming to you, uh, how do we define this, you know, the the the, the the goalpost is changing so fast. So how can we help get some more clarity and how do we define this work, uh, you know, this future of work today? Uh, what should be the key perspectives if you can share, uh, you know, and get, get touch, you know, digitization, digital uh, competencies are equally important. So what, what would your advice for organizations and to uh, individuals uh, be at this point? Oh, fair. Good, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Everyone, depending on where you are, very happy to be uh, invited to uh, today's Sajana. Thanks for hosting me. So, okay, before I start, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about Tech Talent Assembly. We are an affiliated association of uh, NTUC. We are uh, formed about two years ago with the main aim to actually look at how can we help tech talent to stay relevant so they have a lifelong employment. What we noticed in the society today is that there are many tech professionals that are out of a job. And at the same time, there's actually quite a lot of vacancies. So the big disconnect is that there are a lot of people who are actually not, uh, their skills, skill sets are not relevant. So the main aim of the association is to, how do we nudge people towards the right job? And uh, what's the right job? Which is why we did this survey, and uh, which I, I'll talk, elaborate a bit on later on. And we also make this available. Uh, it, it is one year in the uh, making, so quite a fair bit of work. We interview many, many people, and, uh, and that's the end result. So coming to the future of work, before the webinar, you know, the panelists were bantering about, uh, talking about what's happening in our office, and it's quite clear. Remote working is here to stay. Almost all of us talk about, uh, you know, team A, team B, or almost like KK mentioned, about only 10% of his guys work, from, uh, work in the office. I, I talk and we talk about office space. I told them that I just gave up 25% of my office space forever because uh, with team A, team B, why not, right? Save some costs and uh, that helps us to actually be able to plow it back to employee development. So that's number one. I think that is here to stay. Number two, I think a key part of this is that in our conversation as part of the, uh, uh, the survey, we spoke to many employers. So one group of employers we spoke to comes from SG Tech. SG Tech is an association in Singapore that essentially most of the IT companies uh, are a member of. And uh, we're talking about future job. This employer actually told us, they suddenly realized that today, because of COVID, everyone is working remotely. You know, they, they talk to their local employees and they realize that, hey, there's no difference whether the employee is sitting in Singapore or sitting in uh, Myanmar, Vietnam or Timbuktu, right? So essentially it means that there's no longer an advantage if you are a local, right? As long as you have a right skill set, they, 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 you'll be able to find employment. And then another employer chime in and say, oh, I, I think I better start looking for cheaper resources versus the Singaporean. And uh, I was a bit alarmed. I was a bit mm -hmm. alarmed, I mean, for the locals, right? Because uh, that, uh, that means that everyone in Singapore, oh, I, I'm talking to the Singapore audience, everyone in Singapore would be competing against a global talent pool. So just, just remember that you're competing against a global talent pool. So then I, 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 I went deeper and I asked the employers, so where would the local tech talent, where, where is the advantage? Why would you hire a local tech talent? So they gave me two very important things. Number one, you must have the business knowledge, right? And number two, your ability to communicate is so key. And that, again, uh, you know, chimes into dives, uh, uh, what KK mentioned just now, completely actually mirrors that. So it says they need people who can translate whether it's the user requirement or the customer requirement into technical platform. And, uh, and that requires tech savviness. 
again, mm. chiming uh, what KK mentioned. So the two reports are actually very, very similar, right? Yeah. Tax heaviness, the ability to communicate and, uh, and, and, and be able to sell the idea and then transfer it back to the company to build whatever is needed, whether it's for the end user or whether it's for a customer. And that is the same. So that is from the, the tech employers. We interviewed as well many, many CIOs in Singapore. In fact, uh, we did five uh, focus group discussions with the 50 CIOs of the largest companies in Singapore. And one thing is very clear, much as tech jobs is important, the three top tech jobs, I think, is uh, highlighted in the report. Cybersecurity, we're talking about uh, data analytics, we're talking about DevOps-related job. And then in the government, we also spoke to the government as well. They need full-stack uh, uh, developers. But one common thread across everyone is that do they have adaptability skills? So again, very echoing what uh, KK mentioned. Do they have adaptability skills? So they say is that where local employees can stand out is the ability to communicate. And, and what I see, even uh, for me, I run many years as CIO, tech employees who can sell value, who can actually sell value, would be in such demand. If you're selling project, you're selling digitalization, can you sell value to the stakeholders? Why are you doing AI project? Why are you doing data analytics? Mm. What does this buy you? Right, so employees in tech who can sell this will be in high demand, and I can guarantee you that. So a tech job by itself is not not enough. The the adaptability skills, the ability to sell is key. So I I I would uh, my advice to everyone is that I think that is a skill set that should not be uh, you know should not be overlooked. And we have also talked to the uh, government about that as well because over the years you know there has been no focus on the W skills, and we hope that we could bring them back. So generally, I think that's uh, what we have been seeing so far. Well, that's, that's very uh, interesting what you just threw up, uh, Tiongi. And I think what I'm hearing is that, you know, being good at your job is, of course, you know, that's, that's, that doesn't go anywhere. That's the basic requirement, but that's not enough anymore. And, you know, even if you're a techie and you're really, really a great programmer, a great, you know, a project manager, but you also have to be able to uh, have the resilience, the communication skills, and the ability to actually be able to, uh, you know, convince the stakeholders and and uh, you know uh, uh, build all those uh, internal buy-ins or external buy-ins as well. Yep. And another thing that you know, uh, another very interesting thing that you just brought up is the fact that and and, and there's again a lot of conversation around this uh, and we're seeing this. Organizations are starting to explore it is a global talent pool and looking at talent really not from where they are but from what they bring to the table and how that fits in to what the organization is looking to do. And uh, Prithvi, you know this this skill conversation is not. Uh, a, a new conversation. It's been a big focus for a while now and given especially in the context of what Yongi was just saying and with the COVID, uh, you know, the, the new normal that we're in today, how should we be viewing this whole skill story today? And so, how should, uh, sorry. No, I think it's, uh, you know, the points made are, you know, really bring to, bring to life what we are seeing with many of our clients and many of my colleagues and in the community we speak with. I think skills have become the new currency for a future job and a future career. So, you know, the, the, the importance of ensuring that uh, what you are building and what you're investing in today, there is a clear line of sight as to what path you are going to, uh, to sort of use them in. I think the individual employee is starting to demand that much more because he's realized or she's realized that uh, possibly, you know, before this crisis, there was a feeling in some pockets that there was not enough energy by individuals uh, to actually invest in growing their skills. But now I think it's become, uh, there, there is no choice and people have realized that to stay, uh, you know, to have a continued livelihood, this becomes more and more imperative. I think some of the skills that... Uh, both KK and Tiongji spoke about. We've seen them play out, uh, you know, in a in in about four different stages that we've seen in the last few months. And I think different 
adaptive skills are, uh, are needed in and different uh, functional skills are needed at di- and different professional skills are needed at different stages in that cycle you know there was a phase i i would say about 3 to 4 months ago depending with geography or in where people were reacting uh, to the uh, to what suddenly the storm that hit us with the health crisis um and i think this that stage uh, i think many of us sort of uh, stepped up to very well i think the hr teams the cxos i think they all sort of you know dealt with that i think there was a then a stage which i call the re- when people started responding and uh, that the, the second stage of in response was really around saying how do i keep my lights on in my business and keep that continuity going um i think over the last three months we've reached uh, some geographies have entered a sort of reform their business and you know what are the things that they need to change in their business models and in their skill profiles of their people and really as they start the last stage will really be about reimagining what kind of business are you really in and how do you continue to add value i think uh, jyong ji talked about so i think we are seeing the application of these skills that we have talked about so far and some of the stuff that has come out in the surveys that our partners ntuc learning hub and ttab have sort of found are coming are being applied in different proportions depending where you are on this continuum uh, as an enterprise or as a, in your workplace i think come people who have invested proactively in digital skills technology skills uh you know uh, the professional skills to of, of better communication better collaboration are entering the stage of reimagining their business and reforming their business faster i think uh, companies who have still to redo their skill profile around uh, these uh, elements that kk and tyong ji spoke about are possibly still figuring out what the best response for their context may be so i do think skills you know the the strength of your collective organizational skill help or your individual skill help will have a direct pro- impact on your future business success or your your future mm-hmm. career, career success and i think people are starting to look for that clarity uh, more and more uh, especially with the sort of realization that their personal livelihoods may be impacted um so it's a you know very interesting uh, and very uh, need of the hour really for us to sort of uh, i think kk said it very well to for organizations to really collaborate and to see how we can add value back to society in this difficult time for people and organizations and uh, you know you brought up this point about uh, build uh, or uh, you know uh, bring in those skills i don't like the word buy skills <laughs> it doesn't have the right connotation that's again been a conversation you know uh, organizations and learning departments have been talking about what is the right mix for them uh, and this questions to you know uh, any one of you who would like to answer uh, is that given the kind of cost constraints uh, you know because of the economic and business environment today do you see that changing and what does that mean to the actual employee or the job seeker uh um actually in singapore we are quite fortunate we are quite blessed in the sense that the singapore government is so generous about reskilling people and 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 the reasons are quite obvious because uh quite unlike other countries uh, represented here we really don't have any other resources we don't have gold silver tin rubber or whatever right <laughs> or the natural resources we we have none right the only resource that we do have is actually people and uh, we do invest quite a lot on education um even pre work education i think we we spend quite a lot on our education system um and what we're trying to do it, i think in singapore is really to think about how to replicate that um into the working lives of people and that's why we came out with skills future in singapore and this this time around there's the skills future credit there's all kinds of government support schemes to make sure that uh, workers continue to upgrade themselves because if they don't this last resource that singapore has is um this is our only resource so we really have to invest all our money to make sure that resource really works for singapore and uh, so we're quite blessed because if you think about affordability of course actually in singapore is probably 
I dare say around the world, we are probably the most subsidized uh, in terms of offering courses to, to workers in Singapore, uh, probably unprecedented. And that's for the individual le level. Um, and for the employee level, employer's level, I think it's the same thing because uh, uh, some of the schemes even allow the companies to get some kind of absentee payroll when they send workers for courses. Where in the world would you find that? Probably not. Only in Singapore. I, so I would say that uh, the, the the environment is really conducive for us to learn. And now we just have to nudge everybody along as a community to learn so that we can cope with these new changes that we are facing. Yeah. Because because we have removed quite a lot of hurdle in in, in uh, that prevents people from learning. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's and uh, it's commendable the kind of work that you know uh, is happening in Singapore and the kind of backing that the government mm. is giving. Of course, we do have a few people who are not from Singapore uh, who are also on this uh, webcast. Uh, I think for them also, it's very relevant to keep themselves invested uh, mm. and invest in their own uh, development. And many of many countries do have you know are are putting in measures probably not at the same level but uh, you know uh, i think singapore is a gold standard when it comes to that mm -hmm. uh, having so, said that sorry so uh, i'd like to add to that right sure, Kim. So, so so i think uh, kk did mention we are you know very fortunate in singapore i mean you are not only to, we don't only get funding for training in fact the sg united you are paid an allowance to to be trained and i think that is probably unprecedented anywhere in the world so we have all the infrastructure training and, and things like that. That said, I think the responsibility for taking the first step still lies with everyone. One of the things we observe is that, you know, all, you, all of you guys here are probably the percentage of people who wants to upskill or whether you are an employer or whether you are, you know, uh, an employee. And, and, uh, and so, because it's COVID, so we see a lot more. But in the past, I think this is a very small percentage. And uh, I have always in the past encouraged my employee, the responsibility for upskilling and making sure you stay relevant lies with you. And unfortunately, many people look at a, com look a company to do that. And, uh, and, and I think that is, uh, that is a, fa a fallacy. So you mentioned about uh, what about people outside of Singapore? Mm -hmm. Actually, there are so many, many learning materials online. You, you go to Udemy, Udemy is very, very, very affordable. I mean, uh, you can pick up Python, you can pick up anything, right? Uh, but uh, you need a lot more motivation. I, I run the, I'm running a program today and uh, we are trying to get people to come, come up. I think one of the, the and, and what, that's what we're telling our students is, the, is this, right? You've got to own your learning. Yes. You really, I mean, number one thing, you've got to own the learning. You've got to take responsibility for your learning. You cannot look up to your instructor. One thing that worries me is that, uh, you know, many learners, uh, the minute they find obstruction or difficulty, they look up to the instructor. I worry about that is, is that when they finish the course and they go out to, you know, to real life, right? They are not going to have an instructor to look up to. So, my ideal situation of every learner is that take responsibility, try to solve it on your own. And if you can't solve it, then you go back to instructor because this is what you're going to face when you go out after you finish the course. Much So when you go to a course, you go to any program, we facilitate the learning. We don't teach you. Right? So I'd rather not have the download. So it should not, any program you go to should not be a download, but it should be a facilitation on your learning journey. And I hope every learner who are taking this part up remembers that because it's a very, very important thing. No, very, very I, 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 I could not agree more, Tiongli. I think, you know, I read somewhere recently that, uh, and I'm trying to remember if I, I don't want to misquote it, but it uh, was people do not decide their futures. People decide their habits. So if they, if they make the right decisions on the habits, that future will emerge in line with that. So, you know, I think the piece about making learning a habit and ensuring that you we provide, uh, you know, a nudge or a suggestion or a recommendation that can help them make that a daily habit or a weekly habit or a, you know, regular habit becomes sort of a, a big, uh, big uh, need of the hour in whatever society or whatever community you live in. So I think it's a great uh, point. I think the, 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 the time for inertia is which we saw in the past is long dead. Thank you for raising.
and i think if if anyone's not motivated till now this whole pandemic should be the wake up call and motivation Absolutely. for all of us to you know uh, all the people out there who said you know i don't understand zoom and i don't understand webex everyone yeah. understands it now so i think that's the case uh, for you know being motivated for learning having said that we have a quick poll coming up i'll request uh, our team uh, to pull up the poll uh the question is has the focus and effort on skilling changed in your organization in the last 6 months uh we'll have the poll open for a few uh for about uh, a minute or so uh and would love to get responses from all the audience uh while we're waiting for the poll to come up and for the responses i'd also like to mention we are seeing uh, a lot of questions coming in i am making a note of the questions we will keep the last 15 minutes aside for or as many questions as we can answer uh, hope to get through as many as possible achana can i just sure. chip in a little bit yes of um, course kk of to, course to uh, to get yeah, to well. talk a little bit about udemy but uh, actually last uh, in april we actually did a partnership with go one which is the largest uh, e learning uh, uh, provider in the world we i think close to half a million courses and both of our organizations decide to offer uh, e-learning for free 100 courses um during this period trying period so that we can encourage people to learn online you know um and and make it a really really affordable because it's actually a zero cost to <laughs> to to learners in singapore so if you have not had a chance to go into that platform go to our website a little bit of a pitch but really it is really to encourage as many people to learn as possible during this period yeah thanks Thank you so much. I think that's uh, something again for people uh, on this webcast and otherwise to make use of. So we have the poll results. Uh, interesting because uh, while about thirty percent of people have response responded that it's increased significantly, I think a large number are saying it's increased a bit or not changed at all. So uh, an interesting insight to see there. And. going to pull that poll off thank you everyone for those uh, responses so keeping that poll in mind uh, you know given that there is such an unprecedented uh, prediction of job loss again that's global as well as in local markets uh, how should uh, you know uh, what is the what is the way that uh, organizations and individuals are responding to this kk i'm sure at ntuc you would be receiving a lot of queries and information around this anything from your experience that that you can share with us can, can you repeat your question again sorry so it's about uh, you know in terms of how, you know what are the areas that of of skilling that you're seeing as most in demand given that you know there is a fear of job loss there is a downward economy uh, what are the kind of demands that you are receiving and the kind of information at ntuc that you know you are you are getting from your perspective demands in terms of skills is it yes, skills required yes yes in terms yeah. of skills required so maybe i just refer to um so that that i mean back to our framework of uh, adaptive skills technical skills and technology skills i think the key thing really is about adaptive skills and uh the the three adaptive top three is adaptability teamwork collaboration innovation effective communication really important okay. and then digital skills i think um really top in the list is the digital marketing and and for obvious reasons right because i think we don't really have uh, other means to market our product because face to face is quite restrictive and during the covid period so digital presence is mm. quite important whether it's talking about yourself or your product i think the digital presence is important so that emerged really at the top which in the past i think it is probably in the top 10 but not in the top 1 Okay. right and then the second thing is really about project management because at the end of the day when 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 financials are tight um companies do look for people with ability to manage uh projects which are big scale and run it well right uh this because the financial finance is getting tighter and tighter as we speak right so and the third thing is about data uh data uh literacy right um and for obvious reasons because i think with all this interconnectivity and all the devices and sensors that we have we do have a lot of data and we do understand a lot of our, about our consumers when they don't buy something we actually know we actually pick up one data point when they buy something we also pick up a data point so actually we can analyze what 
consumers need. And in this state of flux, when things are changing so quickly, the ability for companies and workers to be able to crunch this data and make sense for businesses so that you can customize solutions for for the customers are really important. So these are the top three skills uh, that we have yeah. on the scope. Um, that's probably from the employer's viewpoint, but I think inside there, there are also other things like robotic process automation and cybersecurity. But top in the list will be this thing about digital marketing, mm-hmm. project management, and data, mm-hmm. right? And, and that leads me to the point that actually we did a data skills study uh, in April this year. So you can again go to the website. I think later on we'll share. We will tool, share. We will things. share. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the audience here can really refer to some of the um, emerging skills that we talked about. Um, and data really is one of the emerging skills. If we look at uh, companies, 98% of companies says that they are more dependent on data than before. And 90% of employees says that actually data is being, being applied in the workplace. Um, so that's the good news. The not so good news is that actually only about 40, half of that says that they are taking actions to learn. So I think that yeah. that connects back to Tongi's point that really, I think if you recognize the need that is out there, I think take the first action because there's never a better time to learn. We can always give a lot of reasons why you don't want to learn because I, I always say that actually learning is a discretionary decision which means that actually if you don't learn, you can still survive. <laughs> how long, I don't know. But you but can't tithe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I think we just have to say, take an action to do it. And last year, I also decided to take an action myself. Uh, I enrolled myself for executive coaching course in the middle of the year. I've been procrastinating for the longest time. I said it's important. Never really take an action myself. And I scolded myself. I said, can you just sign up for it and go for it? And before long, in half a year, I just qualify myself as a coach but so learning is like that right because there are many reasons we can give to say why we don't have the wherewithal and the resources to learn um but i think we we recognize that the, there's the urgent need for us to learn and we just have to say you know take the first move and do it <laughs> i don't know how to say it more elegantly but you just have to take take the first move and, and, yeah. and get into action because learning is not an intellectual exercise Learning yeah. is an action-oriented exercise, which means you right. need to take action. I know how many times I've procrastinated on picking up that, you know, especially when you talk about digital marketing, it's always been something I've wanted to do, but it's been something I've wanted to do and never <laughs> got to pull by the horns. So, and, uh, uh, sorry, I think Prithvi, you wanted to mention something. Oh, yeah. I, I want to add on to uh, this point about top few skills that, because everyone is waiting to hear the magic bullet, right? What, yes. what, should, they, what should they train for? Uh, to be honest, I think that is something that Tech Talent as MBT tap we struggled with as well. Yeah, what what is what are the top three skills should we nudge people towards training for? For instance, every day we read. We, I'm going to get in trouble in this. Every day in the papers, you say or oh, the government say AI, AI, AI. You know, every almost every other day, and so it becomes the most abused word. And when we did our survey, there's no AI jobs. I mean, the AI. Probably data analytics, but uh, there are very few AI jobs. So where is the AI thing coming from? Probably the government. But what we do find when we dig deeper, there is a lot of jobs for people who know the application of AI. right? So, so I think it would be very specific. In almost every company you go to, people say, yes, we are not looking for AI developers, but we're looking for people who knows how to apply AI to their business problem. And okay. most of the time, they're not looking at developing. They're looking at buying an application that already has the AI capability. So that has to be very specific. So we are recently approached by uh, IHL to conduct a survey on whether there are AI jobs. I say, don't need to conduct. I can tell you today, <laughs> right? Depending on where you're looking at, the focus you're looking at, you would not be able to get the right answer. So the top three skills, again, like I say, it is a very difficult because it's a changing target. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but more importantly, we are, we are, what we are struggling is, can we nudge our members to watch the skill and they can get a job, right? I think that at the end of the day is going to be the most important thing, which is why for TTAP, one of the initiatives we want to do, and it's a, it's a big dream, it's, it's an ultimate dream, is to build an ecosystem. 
an ecosystem where we can nudge people towards we, what we think is the top three skills, and, and that is highlighted in the report, and be able to bring in the employers, the SMEs, so that they can actually work together. So as, as the, as the uh, PMATs go through learning, they can get a job. So whether, mm-hmm. as, whether it's as a gig worker, ideally as a full-time employee, but if you, do, you cannot get a, 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 as a job as a full-time employee, at least be a gig worker. So I'm running this program today uh, together with uh, our hub on digital marketing. <laughs> it's a <laughs> right. nine months program. And, and what we did, what, you know, the whole program, the whole focus that I wanted to do is uh, for practitioners by practitioners. That means it's not going to be about training you. So we did on the first week, we bring in the brand owners. So to begin with that in mind, brand owners come in, talk to all the students around, what are they looking for in a digital marketer? And then they give every student a product to sell. And then from there, as we teach them, they started to learn digital marketing. And then brand owners have an advantage because they look at it and say, out of five students are working on this project, the one with the best, I'm going to hire him. So Mm -hmm. that is going to be our approach towards learning jobs, 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 right? So as you are training people, we hope that people get onboarded with jobs. But can we do that on a larger scale? I think on a larger scale, we need an ecosystem. An ecosystem where employers can come in, look for people, look for talent with the right skill set. And to do that, I think it's going to require a lot, lot more effort. But that is what we hope to do. Very ambitious. And, 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 uh, and uh, I just want to address one more point. If you're going to look at our report, you will look at under skills that are diminishing. You'll see digital marketing. So I, I, I don't want to question on that because it seems like contra- contradictory. I will explain to you why. Because the first time I look at it and say, I thought digital marketing is, is increasing tremendously. Why is it uh, we, after our survey and everything comes as di- diminishing? So I found the answer. The answer is this. There are so many digital marketing courses out there. A zillion out there. I mean, you, you are, you're probably bombarded with, in your Facebook, right? This digital marketing course, that digital marketing course. And I found that people who go for two-day digital marketing course come out and call themselves digital marketers. And there's so many out there. So, so the big problem I see is that digital marketing certification is not regulated. One of the problems is that it is not a professional. It's not a profession today. It's not regulated. So you can all kinds of qualities. I've, talk, I've talked to SME uh, people who, who approach Yellow Pages to help them. He says, oh, because we are going for cheapest and you're this guy who are offering very cheap and at the end of one month or two months, he couldn't do it because this guy attended a two-day digital marketing course and decided to hop mm. the skills. So one of the things we want to do is actually to see how we can regulate this industry, have a certification body that's independent of everyone so that we can actually when employees look at hiring digital marketers, you know, okay, this guy is certified versus the, you know, there's a zillion of them out there. How do you actually differentiate? So just to clarify that in case you're reading a report and say, hey, Tongi, I thought, how come your, 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 this thing says that it's a diminishing demand? It's not diminishing, but because there's such a huge, huge digital marketers out there that are not actually qualified. In fact, very pertinent because I was also saying, you know, monitoring the chat window and that was one of the points somebody brought up was that really by doing a two-day, three-day course, is that enough for them to build that skill? So I'm so glad you've, you know, qualified that particular point. And there's another point someone also brought up, which I want to bring into this conversation is about, you know, is, uh, you know, is there a mistaken belief and that comes from Mohan? Uh, is that one starts upskilling or learning new skills, the job assurance is there. I think there's a difference between that and what we're talking about today is being relevant to the kind of roles that are available. So maybe Prithvi, if you can share, you know, give give some qualification to that particular perspective. Yeah, I, I think one of the things we realized, you know, as we've been working with the uh, NTUC Learning Hub and uh, TTAB to sort of see how we can contribute in to the comment that Yongji made about the ecosystem as to what is the what is the need to be able to sort of help people navigate to a job? I think the the first part really is about understanding your current skill profile. So Mm. one of the key pieces of work that we've been doing is really build tools which we can provide access to people around how do you get an understanding of your current skills. Once you know where you stand today, you can sort of see how the skills can be translated into what opportunities because otherwise 
you usually you know you, uh, you follow a title and you say oh i'm a i'm a data guy and i'm i'm going to always grow in that and, you know to make transitions into different career paths you know whether you're an accountant are you always going to be an accountant or can you mm-hmm. use accounting skills in other jobs if you were mm-hmm. if you're in the retail industry and you know as retail becomes more automated what can i use my skills at or in, in the hospitality industry how can i transition my guest relation skills to other jobs i think that that knowledge graph of being able to understand which skills works where that's the second area that you know we've really been focused on as we sort of tr- trying to play a role in this ecosystem and sort of see what we can do and i think the the you know in the next couple of days we will be uh, launching what we are calling a career agility hub along with ttab and uh, mm. ntuc learning hub and that really is a sort of navigator which says that if you know where you stand today you know what your skills which kinds of roles or which kind of career paths your skills can be applicable in how many jobs exist in that area and can you uh, you know have an opportunity to explore them so our our purpose is really to sort of help in that journey because i think it is a very difficult journey um and i think one of the things we've realized is that skills does not translate to a job or it doesn't translate to employment our focus really should be about increasing our employability options correct um and i think if we can point people to the right uh, learnings i think a lot which has been spoken about by by my colleagues on the panel um and then see how that those learnings can translate to jobs if we can show people that journey i think half the battle Uh, is yeah. one and we can actually be of you know we can truly add value in this uh, space so that's really what we have been sort of invested in and we are quite excited uh, in the next few days to actually put the what we are calling the career agility hub out on uh, and make available to the ttab um, members as well as the ntuc learning hub community no in fact uh, i think also uh, very uh, required that i would love to get uh, kk and Yongi also to talk a little bit from their perspective on this and how it's going to really help the job seekers, especially and on an employability perspective. What I'd also like to do in parallel is that you know pull up a poll question to understand where people feel there, you know, uh, and hearing the conversations in the polls uh, in in the chat group is the clarity in terms of where to go and what is it that they should be doing to be more employable. So would also like to at the same time pull up the poll uh, to get a sense of what our uh, audience. uh has a perspective at this point in terms of their clarities yeah so maybe i can just start i think uh this this is actually a study that says that sorry you want to give time for the poll or uh, you... we i think we can have people answer while we're speaking that should be yeah so i i think there's a study that says that 80% of the jobs in 2030 have not really been uh invented and i i i do believe that because actually if you think about it some of the jobs that are currently uh being done right like bloggers v bloggers i never imagined those are jobs you know? <laughs> but they they have become jobs and community specialists people who can engage the community so that they stay inside your group groupings and your your associations etc so those are new jobs that are emerging so if 80% which means that 8 out of 10 jobs have not been invented which means that actually if you think about it there will be a lot of new jobs and it's emerging as we, as we speak and when they emerge a lot of employers don't even have the jd job description of the jobs and schools don't even have curriculum for those jobs you know because they are so new right um and and you raised the point about assurance um in the past probably i, I when i first stepped into the workforce we always look for job security and yes. that was possible then uh, that shows how old i am um uh, that was possible then because actually organizations do stay really long i mean they they survive for 40 50 years without any problem but if you look at the longevity of companies today they are bothering in the in the tens right which means that companies survive maybe only 10 to 15 years now we work typically maybe 40 years in our life if companies only stay 15 years in the in their life span which means that actually we outlast most companies right which means that actually we probably need to transition between jobs in our working life almost three to four times at the very least 
right? And and there's no assurance what are the new jobs because old business are being eradicated and new business are coming in and there'll be new jobs being defined. But I think importantly is that open mindset. In fact, this morning, I just went to visit uh, Urban Farming. Uh, that was uh, founded by a friend of mine in Singapore. Okay, there's Urban Farming in Singapore because we are urban. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and when I look at the job, it's really exciting because it's all about sensors. This, it's all about monitoring the, the fertilizer, water content, etc., etc., to make sure that your plants grow almost close to perfection as opposed to the gut feel, right? And actually, a lot of engineers can go into those shops. Yeah. But it requires that switching of mindset to say that, actually, this is one industry that I can apply my knowledge. And I think uh, Privet talked a little bit about skills gap. But before we even talk about skills gap, I think at the individual level, we need to ask ourselves, what is our strength? You know, what is the strength that I have? For example, I can tell you my strength is in data. I am very good at numbers. So, so I will go into a job with numbers. And my strength is in learning, so I'll go into a job in learning. So I think you need to understand your strength. And secondly, you need to understand what's your passion. Because your passion and your strength really drives your career success. And once you've determined that this is the area of job that you're going into, then we can do a skills gap analysis because then we know where's a destination. But if we do not know where's a destination, there's no way anybody, even AI, can do that skills gap analysis. So I think, I think my advice is that people who are thinking about switching career really understand where your strength is, where is your passion. Um, and sometimes probably even in the career switch, you may have to take, you may have to bite the bullet initially because you're learning a new skill. You may have to start a little bit from the beginning again. But I think you have a longer runway because those are emerging jobs in the offering. So i give you an example about emerging jobs, urban farming, because we are trying to be more uh, sustainable in our food. If you think about renewable energy, if you think about solar energy, electrification, Right, we're already talking about electric cars, right? And 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 somebody has to think about how to keep these electric cars going, right? In yeah. Singapore, right? So I I think really you need to go deeper, and and those people who still need to work 20, 30 years, maybe think into the future and see whether these areas really excite you, and if they do, maybe take that first step in 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 learning some of the new skills and build a a long career because those are new trends that we are picking up very interesting because it's no longer about being an expert in a particular industry but having a certain set of expertise and skills that you can apply you know which can be totally industry agnostic and and the world is really then your oyster yeah. uh, and we do have the poll results as well which i had shared just to for everyone's clarity i think uh, a large number of people uh, you know uh, almost 80 percent are saying that they are only somewhat clear or need clarity on their career paths. And that's also coming across from the questions that we have from the audience here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in the survey. Uh, I think uh, one of the questions, and I think maybe, KK, if you can answer that, uh, where you talked about you know, adaptability skills, uh, the question is from Asraf is, uh, why have communication and ability to sell value become visibly more important? Is it because there are not enough jobs to go around today? I always feel that actually communication skill is one of the most important soft skills that any individual should have because it allows you to communicate a vision. It allows you to communicate the value. It allows you to communicate your worth, your your strength to potential employers. Um, you allows you to communicate an idea across. Um, and, and communication is not being eloquent. Communication mm -hmm. is put, being articulate. means that actually you are able to convince and influence people around you. And that's so much needed in the interconnected world where we work across boundaries, across culture, you know, um, in, in, in most of our jobs today. So communication is really important because you just need to work across differences. And 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 uh, and then you may have a very diverse team, right? Diversity in age, 
diversity in gender, diversity in nationality, diversity in um, educational background, diversity in skills, and again, your ability to manage and influence this group of people is really important. We have, I don't think we have ever been more diverse than before. After, mm. after globalization, we're just so melting pot mm. in everywhere we go, right? <laughs> Our companies are just so diverse because you see different people from different walks of life. And, and I think communication helps us bridge that gap right? Um, maybe you think about the converse. If we lack communications, maybe for that question, you think about if you lack communication skills, what are the hurdles, hmm. right? Then, then maybe you understand the value of communication. Example, then you cannot work across boundaries. You cannot work in a diverse environment, which is actually important for innovation and stuff like that. Then maybe then you can, tra- you can understand the value of communication. Right, so so I think that this is one of the most important skills, evergreen skills, is but it's one of the most difficult skills to to uh, to build. All of us know that uh, communication is a very important skills, but when you ask people to to go into train themselves, hone their skills in communication, a lot of us there's one book that says that actually is the number one feared item, more feared than Jumping from an let's say parachuting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, standing in okay. front of a uh, hundred people and just speaking. That's no, yeah. everyone's fear. Yeah, right? I, I, I think uh I think it's a very, very important skill, but at the same time I agree, right? It's a very difficult skill and you've got to work at it. And yeah. I keep telling you you gotta work at it. It doesn't come to you naturally, which means you've got to spend time. Spend time to enable you practice, practice and practice. I, I have a group of mentors and the first thing I told all my mentors is that practice your communication skill. Join, a, you know, the, uh, uh, what, what you call master club where you can speak in public and uh, get critiques. Because you don't work at it, you can never improve. But the, but the most important point I want to come back to is what Previ talked about, the career agility hub. And I, yes. I, I want to emphasize that it's, uh, we are also excited about it. We are, we are very excited because I think the Career Agility Hub is uh, what I mentioned about, right? Helping us build an ecosystem where individuals can come in, look at where the skills gap are, look at how to get uh, help in terms of the ability to, you know, what courses to go to. But more importantly, right, more importantly, what we hope to do is to build communities of people with like-minded people. So what do you mean by communities? If you come to this uh, career GP hub, we're going to ask you a few questions. Then we know, okay, this guy is a cybersecurity guy. This guy is a DevOps guy. This guy is a data analytics guy. We want to group all of these guys together. Or you are maybe in DevOps and say, I want to go data analytics. Then we group you into the community. Then within the community, you have instantly, well, that's what we hope, support. When I look at the survey earlier, right, a lot of people doesn't know where what they want to do. Exactly. So, it tells me two things. What can Kay talk about? Going coaching, that's the right, right, right uh, course to go to because I think a lot of people need coaches. Number two, people who don't have the uh, access to a coach, then a community becomes a place where they have access to and that's what we hope to do. A career agility hub then become a support system which we hope to have that people who want to go into a particular specialization can go in and then, and then uh, over time, we hope that people can answer those questions. And, uh, and then people get clarity. So I'm very, very excited about Career, career to the Hub. I, you know, people ask when, are, when is it going to be launched. I, I hope really soon. I, I mean, we, are, we, we want to make sure we have a perfect launch. And at the same time, I also ask for your patience when you go, when you come into the, this first version, please have patience and uh, work with us. But the main goal is at the end of the day to have an ecosystem where individuals can learn about their, you know, their gaps, upskill, and hopefully find jobs, and at the same time find support within the same skill set. Yeah, I, I think this really answers exciting. a a lot of questions people were talking about in terms of uncertainty on how to approach and what to do, how to become unemployable. Uh, that was a lot of you know the theme of the questions that were coming up. So I think Career Agility Hub, uh, and I congratulate all three of you. KK, if there's anything else you would like to add to this, 
I uh, would love to hear from you as well. Uh, so I just want to pitch in on this uh, career agility. It's something that we, we, we. I started with Previ, <laughs> uh, <laughs> almost almost two years back. Uh, the com- the right. first conver- the first conversation, and I was quite excited. And then we say, why don't we do it for a certain community? So we say that actually both of us we decided that actually IT and ICT is probably one of the better community. And the reason is because the skills required for jobs in ICT are very well defined. Correct. It can be measured. Then then we say, hey, we need to bring in a community. Then we we met Tiongi and says, come join us. So this is a level <laughs> of collaboration. But we really hope that after this this test, um, if it's successful in this community, I, I hope to be able to replicate in other communities as well because the concept is the same. The concept of finding you know emerging trends and declining trends and finding the gap analysis for workers so that eventually there's a better matching between um, workers and uh, and jobs is really important. So I am excited about it and yeah. So that bit my last comment for for today here. <laughs> no, thank you both for uh, sharing that. You know, I think the the need of the hour is really for uh, for companies to and organizations and associations to take progressive steps because you know what we've done in the past uh, has got us to here and that's you know we are in a strong place but what we need to do to go forward to help people build employability and access to jobs maybe we all need to experiment and actually do new things so i think you know with kk's advocacy and sponsorship and with yongji's stepping in to actually lead the charge we've been actually very excited to be part of this system to make those initial steps to build something which we think is a new way of career management and learning management and really puts the power of those decisions in the hands of the user uh, based on what he's learning from the community and the crowd. So we are also very keenly uh, looking forward in the next few months to actually see how that system learns on it as more and more users are onboarded. So as we sort of uh, roll this out over the, uh, you know, progressively over the next few weeks uh, you know and more users come on the insights and recommendations will continually improve so you know i must put on record my appreciation uh, for, for for that uh, for those uh, for that support that i've got from both your organizations and i'm also you know keen that uh, it sort of addresses this topic of adapting to the future of work by doing something really significant so thank you for that my congratulations to all three of you thank you so one and last I'm sure it's going to yeah. be uh, sorry, you were saying. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So one last point. Uh, I, I saw a question addressed and I understand there's quite mm-hmm. a lot of employers, I mean, the employers in your audience. And uh, one of them mentioned that, so what do you have for employers? Well, I think there are a lot of training out there for employers. Let me give you an example. I was talking to a group of SME employers. So there, there was this uh, owner that strikes me uh, in a conversation that uh, was very interesting. And uh, he mentioned that he wanted to, for the longest time, he, did, he didn't know how to digitalize. He says that what gave him the push was when he was doing chocolates, chocolate distribution. And one day he found that uh, he doesn't have the expiry date of all his chocolates. Can you imagine how a nightmare it is? Wow. And he doesn't know where the chocolates are going to expire, where it is stored. And at one point he said his company will go bankrupt. And uh, he found from his friend who is the owner of Sheng Xiong who brought him to Xingxiong, look at their warehouse management system. And from there, he says he went on a digitalization journey and never looked back. So, and then he asked me, so I heard a lot about AI. So how can AI help my business? So many employers are actually asking questions like this because they, they, they hear all these super terms by in IT, right? I mean, please ignore them. I, I mean, IT for 30 years and IT people are the best in coming up with new terms, DevOps, cloud, so on and so forth. But Essentially, they mean the same thing. Just very fancy name to actually make the IT vendors more money. I, I mean, I'm only kidding. <laughs> so, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I, I, all I'm saying is that there are many, you know, webinars out there that actually speaks to the business owners. So look out for it, especially SME owners, because we understand SME owners does have a lot need a, require a lot of help in terms of digitalization. 
Mugi, I like your story, but I I thought the the punchline was fair price, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, we're over time, and we're starting to get those kind of you know messages from the audience, and I would really like to thank them. They've been so involved. Uh, they've been so interactive, and you know, all three of you have been so wonderful. I, uh, again, my congratulations on not just to three of you, to all uh, employees and employers in the Singapore region for for this launch. I think everyone will benefit from that. And just to recap, I think one of the key things, uh, you know, themes that came across from this uh, uh, webinar is the fact that it is so important not just for organizations to support the learning and skill development of their employees, but also for each of us to take that in our own hands, to understand what our strengths are, what our skills are, and to be able to apply them to current roles that we're in, as well as, you know, if, if jobs are becoming more uncertain jobs, uh, the job market is so fluid that we should be able to understand how we can apply our skills, uh, KK, as you mentioned, in other jobs, other new emerging industries uh, where they still need the, uh, the, you know, people with digital savviness, people with good financial skills, or whether, you know, you have good communication skills, uh, which is very coveted today. But uh, on that note, uh, would, you know, encourage everybody who's been part of this. We've had more than 400 participants. So thank you, all of you. And I hope if you've not always already started, please begin your learning journey to stay current and to stay uh, skilled in this environment. That's the most important message. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.